coming up on the Sark Fighter podcast. Are there some patients who just die from sarcoidosis? Unfortunately, yes. Dr. Xu Yi Liao is trying to answer some of the questions we all have about sarcoidosis. How does it move within our bodies, and why do some people get it and others not? I try to see uh, if any kind of specific biomarker can predict certain patients that their sarcoidosis will continue getting worse. Dr. Liao of National Jewish Health Hospital in Denver joins me here next on the Sark Fighter Podcast. This is the Sark Fighter Podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Well, hello and welcome. This is episode 56 of the Sark Fighter podcast, brought to you in part by a grant from Atire Pharma. I'm your host, John Carlin. I want to let you know that if you have pulmonary sarcoidosis and are between the ages of 18 to 75, you may qualify for a new clinical trial. The Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is excited to be partnering with Novartis for a research study to test an investigational treatment that may help those living with pulmonary sarcoidosis. This opportunity is not only taking place in the U.S., there are also international locations available, and you can visit www.stopsarcoidosis.org to learn more and to see if you qualify. For participating international locations, you can check out clinicaltrials.gov and search sarcoidosis CMK389. There will be a link in the show notes. Well, hello, everyone. I do this podcast to offer you, my fellow Sark fighters, hope and to help you connect with other Sark patients, to hear their stories, to understand how sarcoidosis affects their lives, and hopefully it helps you kind of understand what you're up against and what you need to overcome, whether it's the disease or the effects of these strong medications that we all take, or maybe both. Um, Unfortunately, in many cases, it's both. You can't tell what's making you more miserable, the disease or the medications used to fight it. But today, I have a solid dose of hope. I'll be talking with Dr. Shu Yi Liao at National Jewish Health Hospital in Denver, who's a SARC specialist. Several days a week, he's in the lab researching how SARC moves through our bodies and other topics related to sarcoidosis. But then the rest of the week, he's in the clinic working with patients And in his words, some of the most severe cases of people with sarcoidosis, because when you get to National Jewish Health, they have some regular patients, but a lot of times they're getting referrals from smaller medical centers or smaller doctor's offices where they're just not equipped to handle the problems that come with sarcoidosis. So he and his colleagues get some of the most severe cases there at the clinic in Denver. And people do travel a great distance to get that specialized care. So uh, probably unlike wherever you go, the and doctors only have a handful of cases. Dr. Liao and his colleagues see a lot of sarcoidosis patients, but that helps them uh, have an opportunity to do studies. And as he'll tell you, and it also... Um, It also means that um, he is looking at sarcoidosis every single day, and I think that's really critical to to getting to the bottom of care. Now, before I get to today's guest, I got to tell you that once again, my trusty dog, Dougal, is curled up on the chair in my office, keeping me company. My third dog, Boone, who's much older, he's a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, has trouble getting up and down the stairs, has made the trek up the hardwood stairs, and he's joined me here in the office today. So I have lots of good company. And I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but I do have two aquariums in my office. One is home to a pair of clownfish, saltwater fish. Think of Nemo in the movie Finding Nemo. I have a pair of them swimming around and they are uh, they're guarding their little piece of rock right now that they absolutely love. And the other aquarium I have, which is actually larger, hosts a variety of fish that are all from one lake, Lake Tanganyika in Africa. And yes, I'm a fish geek. You don't you don't buy uh, most of these fish at your random fish store. So I'm a fish geek. I won't get into it. But I got to tell you that these fish are swimming peacefully, and they are one of the uh, 
one of the things that I do when I'm getting down or when I'm getting anxious, I can come in and, and look at one of my aquariums and it really does bring my heart rate down. There's actually actually research to support all of this, not just for SARC patients, uh, in fact, not for SARC patients at all, but for people with any kind of anxiety. Um, looking at an aquarium has... Uh, been shown to be extremely therapeutic. And that's also true for people with Alzheimer's and nursing homes and so forth and so on. And I won't get into it. I know more about fish than you'll ever want to know. Let me just say that all the fish are swimming peacefully and uh, they're making me happy. And I hope you won't hold the fact that I'm a fish geek against me. Now, having said all of that, I recently emceed an amazing event for the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research, and I want to tell you about that right now. It was called Universal Barriers in uh, uh, It was called Universal Barriers in Dealing with a Chronic Disease: A Sarcoidosis Perspective, and we recorded this on the evening of January 25th. People were able to sign up, and there were hundreds of people signed up and in the audience listening to a variety of speakers. One was Chasta Posey. She is a 16-year survivor of SARC. She's uh, served in several roles. I've interviewed her a couple of times here on the podcast. Uh, and so she is a volunteer with FSR. She's a patient ambassador, patient advocate, patient navigator, peer mentor. And she's also served as the upstate representative for the Sarcoidosis Foundation in South Carolina, where she lives. And she really enjoys helping people. She is just a wonderful person and has has a very severe case of sarcoidosis. It's caused blindness in one eye, and uh, and that's just the beginning of her battle with SARC. Also on the panel is Jim Kuhn. Jim is a rare disease warrior, advocate, speaker, mentor. He was diagnosed in 2014 with SARC that initially started in his lungs and his lymph nodes, and then it spread to his eyes and his skin. Most recently, he was diagnosed with neurosarcoidosis. Jim is one of those people who probably would really benefit from Dr. Liao's research. Um, but he has a couple of other several uh, SARC-related rare diseases, a very complicated medical condition. And uh, Jim is one of these people who has helped so much. He's kind of an expert on us putting together these panels, putting together these research teams and and doing that in a systematic way so that we know it's all done properly. It's not haphazard. The meetings are run properly. And he came from a big corporate background and really brings all of that to the table. And uh, I will tell you that Jim uh, is, is going through a, a pretty severe bout with a flare-up of sarcoidosis and came to our meeting the day before the seminar directly from the hospital. And, but he was so dedicated to doing it, he joined our, our sort of pre-planning meeting, and then he made it to the actual meeting itself. So that kind of shows you his dedication. And then also on the panel is Dr. Ennis James, who became interested in SARC as a pulmonary and critical care fellow at Virginia Commonwealth University here in Virginia, where I live, and then joined the pulmonary faculty at the Medical University of South Carolina back in 2015. He is a member of the FSR Scientific Advisory Board and FSR's Clinical Studies Network and serves as the program director for the Susan Pearlstein Sarcoidosis Center of Excellence. And he strongly believes in its vision of improving the lives of SARC patients by providing a coordinated, patient-focused, multidisciplinary care and cutting-edge SARC research. And uh, he's happy to see sarcoidosis patients with any kind of organ involvement. And and for the record, Chasta tells us outright that that he is her doctor. So, um, so basically, we brought all of these people together in an event sponsored by Malincrot Pharmaceuticals uh, through the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research, and we uh, we talked a lot about not only sarcoidosis but about how different people who are fighting SARC have different obstacles to overcome beyond what's going on with their own individual bodies. And you're going to hear Dr. Liao today talking about how SARC is different for, for every patient. And each patient, um, you know, a medication that works for me may not work for you. And, and one of the things he's trying to figure out is why. But there are other obstacles to care that come more from an environmental aspect. So uh, different people, and, and one of the big takeaways 
is uh, different people who live in different zip codes have huge barriers to care because when you live in a certain area, you, you may not have access to medical care. You may not have access to healthy foods for healthy eating. You may have access to the medical care, but you're coming from an environment where it is difficult for you to find transportation to the hospital or child care for you to get to the hospital. So you start throwing all of these barriers up, and we looked at them doing a really interesting exercise. Um, you look at them and they start to accumulate. And so, it, you know, in my case, I'll tell you straight up, I have very few barriers to care. Yes, I'm suffering with neurosarcoidosis and it's blocking pathways from my brain to the lower parts of my body. And so that's made life difficult for me in more ways than one. And I've taken some awful medications and and suffered uh, you know, in in the way that's impacted me. But then you take that and compound that. Well, what if I wasn't able to get to the hospital? What if I didn't have insurance? Or what if I had insurance, but I didn't have a ride? Or, you know, all these different barriers. And so we looked at these universal barriers for people. And, and I'll bet if you're listening to this, some of these things are beginning to ring true for you. And and so we, we looked at all of that. And I don't want to give you a spoiler alert. I want you to go back and listen to the bonus episode, but I'm not posting it as a regular podcast. I'm posting the audio from that so you can listen. So you'll you'll hear each of us speaking. You'll hear uh, Mindy Buchanan, who is a, uh, a, a staff person with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. She's sort of an all everything. And Mindy, I'm sorry, I don't have your title handy, but Mindy is Mindy is is a person who makes everything. One of the people who makes everything work at the foundation. You'll hear her introduce us and uh, and also uh, give a closing, and, and then it'll be myself and Chasta, Dr. James. Uh, and Jim Kuhn all talking about these different things, and you'll hear some some exercises that you may want to take as well while you are listening to the podcast and sort of see where you land. All right, so that's a bonus episode. It was just recently posted, and you just have to search for that, and I'm sure you will be able to find it. And again, that was called Universal Barriers in Dealing with a Chronic Disease, a Sarcoidosis perspective. And we recorded that on January 25th of 2022. Okay, let me um, tell you right now that Sarcoidosis News is reporting an interesting new study on cardiac SARC. And I've interviewed a number of people who have cardiac SARC in their heart. And recently, back in episode 50, I interviewed Warden Robinson, whose father died from cardiac sarcoidosis after never knowing he had it. So that is clearly a real danger. And I just want to give you just a quick look at what this study found. And this is particularly interesting for women, okay? Females with suspected cardiac sarcoidosis experience chest pain and palpitations more frequently than males, but their heart is affected less severely by the condition, according to a recent study. Yet the incidence of either death from all causes or significant ventricular arrhythmia, an abnormal rhythm in the heart's lower chambers in the long term, was similar in both male and female patients. The findings make a strong argument for the routine and systematic inclusion of sex-specific analysis in sarcoidosis research, and this is according to Shitan Shinoy, MD, an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Medical School and the study's lead author. And there's a, a news release that they've put out about this. I'm reading to you directly uh, from the sarcoidosis news version of that news release. But basically it says such practices could eventually lead to an improved understanding of sex differences in the diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis of patients with suspected cardiac sarcoidosis and then, and then therefore promote improved outcomes in both sexes. And I'm not going to get into all the, the fine print here, but there were 324 patients with suspected cardiac SARC, 163 females, 161 males. And females and males had a similar prevalence of symptoms, so they were equally likely to get it, such as shortness of breath, uh, near fainting or fainting, abnormal heart rhythms. Females more commonly had chest pain, 37% 
versus 23% in men, and palpitations, 39%, 26% in men. So basically, females are more likely to have an outward feeling of the symptoms. Therefore, I think the takeaway is they may be more likely to feel that they have it. But um, if you want to read more about it, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes here on the uh, Sark Fighter podcast. So I just like to try and keep you up to date on everything that's going on uh, with sarcoidosis. So uh, that's the latest. And again, that's being reported by Sarcoidosis News, which you can subscribe to. Uh, That is uh, an email that I get weekly and they give me updates and they kind of keep me informed on what's going on. I want to tell you more now about my guest today before we get to the interview, Dr. Shu Yi Liao, MD, MPH, and SCD. He's a pulmonologist and assistant, prof- assistant professor at National Jewish Health. He joined uh, National Jewish in 2019, focusing on the research of sarcoidosis, and he is also a recipient of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research Fellowship Grant. Uh, in 2020 through 2022, and he's studying the effect of genetics, transcriptonomics, hope I said that right, and metabolomics on sarcoidosis, pathogenesis, progression, and treatment with multiple peer-reviewed publications in his field. I don't know what that means to you, but uh, we'll, we'll, I'll try to break, I do break it down for you as the interview goes on. I'll just tell you quickly that Dr. Liao received his MD from National Taiwan University and then other degrees from Harvard School of Public Health, and he completed his internal medicine residency at the University of California, Riverside, and his pulmonary and critical care medicine fellowship at the University of California, Davis. So let's just say that he's a big deal, okay? He, he's got the credentials all day long. And his study, founded by the Foundation for Sark Research, says that he wants to identify novel variants of sarcoidosis susceptibility. So he wants to figure out why different people are more susceptible to SARC uh, for different reasons. Then he wants to identify these biomarkers in the blood that predict chronic sarcoidosis progression leading to the development of an algorithm predicting sarcoidosis progression and ultimately, with future research, lead to individualized care and treatment. And and he goes on and he gets down into the different genomes that he's looking at and so forth, things that probably you have to be a clinician or researcher to understand. But then he also received a new grant that's focused on sarcoidosis And this study aims to identify people or populations who are most likely to respond to sarcoidosis treatments. And the goal of the study is to explore the metabolomic profiling change, one of the most accurate measuring tools in order to track or detect molecular causes of health issues. And after starting methotrexate treatment by comparing the blood sample before and after six months of the treatment, that study starts enrollment right now in the spring of 2022. But you do have to be able to get to him at National Jewish Health. Um, so, and, and I ask him a lot about that during the interview. So basically, you've got the, the research that's ongoing that I told you about, and now they're going to identify people or populations of people, so say white Caucasians from Northern Europe or African Americans or other groups of people that doctors separate us into who are most likely to respond, and he wants to look specifically at methotrexate. The takeaway here is right now it's trial and error. So let's say you walk into the doctor's office and you have sarcoidosis, and uh They say, okay, well, you're going to take prednisone right off the bat. And then when you're done with that, we're probably going to put you on methotrexate. And if that doesn't work, we'll try the next drug and then the next drug and then the next drug. Well, it takes six months on each of these drugs to figure out what you're dealing with. They are trying to get to the point where you bypass all that trial and error, especially with the methotrexate and say, all right, we know you're predisposed because you've got these markers and we know you're the type of person where methotrexate will not work or will work. And so we're going to either put you on methotrexate or we're going to jump right on to the next drug. And then they want to be able to predict what that next drug is and what's going to work the best. So he and that research is the topic of the interview today. And I hope that you will will find that interesting and informing. 
And I want you to stay tuned because Dr. Shu Yi Liao is next here on the Sark Fighter podcast. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter Podcast. You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick Welcome in back to, to the Sark Fighter Podcast. And joining me now is Dr. Shuhi Liao, who is doing research. some amazing look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter Podcast. That, answer answer some some that we, think we all have about sarcoidosis. Dr. Liao, thank you for joining me on the Sark Fighter Podcast. Thank you for inviting me. So your research, you're doing two-pronged research. You've already kind of finished one project and you're starting another. Let's talk about the one that, that uh, you've, you've uh, and I, you know, finished is a relative term because research is never finished. It just gets you to the next step. What have you been working on to date? Yeah, so so the, the first part I did uh, roughly in the in the past two years is where I'm trying to develop a certain kind of biomarker. This can be from the DNA or from the RNA, basically from the biomarker from the blood. I try to see uh, if any kind of specific biomarker can predict certain patient that their sarcoidosis will continue getting worse or they will be in the remission. So this is kind of uh, the, the, the thing I've been doing the past two years. All right, so, so let me just cover some ground here for people who may be listening that are trying to figure out what sarcoidosis is all about. And I'm using round figures here, but roughly half the people who get sarcoidosis, it goes away on their own. And then for uh, the rest of us who have it as a chronic illness, um, it's, either hangs around or gets worse. And you're trying to figure out why some people it goes away and some people it gets worse. And what's, what's the probability? Is there some way to predict who's going to get worse, right? Right. So basically what I'm trying to see, instead of waiting them to getting worse in the past six, next six months or a year, if we can develop some biomarker, even when they first show in the clinic, and then we have this biomarker and say, Hey, you, you, you are in the, the, the patient category. You might get worse in the next six months to a year. We might need to be starting, maybe starting the treatment earlier, or we might want to see you more like early on rather than, you know, come back every one year or something like that. So have you, have you found that biomarker? Yeah, we found a couple biomarker, but you know, right now with the data, you know, in the past, other study or other researcher also has been working on the biomarker. One of the issues is some 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 people like some researcher that may be only working on the genetics or like DNA. Some people may be working on the RNA, some people may be working on the protein. And then the the power or say if you're only looking for specific biomarker in certain kind of like gene or something, you're not you are not have a strong enough information to tell us, you know, which patient is going to progress it. So my 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 research is the difference. I try to collect a different kind of data, not just the DNA, I collect DNA, RNA, protein, metabolomic, use all this kind of different kind of omic see give more, more information and try if we can have better prediction so this is kind of still ongoing and this is in the blood that you're you're looking when you get these biomarkers a biomarker is something in the blood that you can look for right we we also looking for the uh we also looking for the biomarker in the lung fluid but my goal is to be using the biomarker in the blood because it will be easy to to uh easy to obtain uh, rather than you need to do a bronchoscopy or biopsy, that kind of thing. So my sure. goal to apply to the blood would be much easier to be a uh, use. I'd much rather have a blood test than somebody going in and uh, taking a piece of my lung out. <clears throat> right. 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 
for sure. So, so, so you're, you've, you're starting to discover these biomarkers. I mean, are you at a point where you have discovered some patients where you could say definitely you're going to get worse? Unfortunately, not yet. It, it's kind of ongoing. So, so, so not yet. So I think this is kind of big work. And then uh, we just have some pilot study. So am I able to identify certain kind of patient? But this is not, uh, this is not, you know, not able to, because usually we need more sample and more data in order to do that. So I'm not able to say we got a, uh, okay, 96% correction, that, that kind of thing. I'm not able to say that. But this is the goal. Do you think that down the road, being able to find out <clears throat> why, why it goes away in some people and why it gets worse in other people, will, will that maybe lead to a cure or lead to understanding what causes sarcoidosis? Yeah, definitely. I think one of the issues in the past is very difficult to identify specific cause for the sarcoidosis. Just sarcoidosis is so heterogeneous. It's not like cancer or other disease, you know, kind of diagnosis kind of clear, but sarcoidosis, certain patients just have a sucker in the lung, certain patients have a sucker in the eye, certain patients have a sarcoidosis all over, certain patients only have a sucker in the skin. So it's very difficult to kind of identify a single cause that may be multiple. So with the, the research I do in the past two years, I'm able to identify kind of different, can we say, different kind of type of sarcoidosis. Yeah, and they may be different. Well, that's amazing. So, so you'll continue doing that research and searching for that, correct? And that was a that was a, a grant from the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research that funded that. Right, right. Gotcha. So, how many patients did you look at when you were doing that? So, so right now, uh, for the genetic part, we have uh, about like thousand or fifteen hundred patients. Really. For the, for the genetics part. So Liz is looking for the genetics. And then uh, for the uh, gene expression, we have a smaller sample, probably 400, 500. And then I also looking for the uh, metabolomic. Uh, metabolomic is just kind of starting because uh, I, I started the metabolomic in the past one year. So right now I only got around like a, a 200 or something like that, but still kind of expanding. That's that's a great sample size for you to uh, to have so quote unquote specimens to research, isn't it? Right, because at National Jewish, even before I joined the National National Jewish, we have been uh, starting to collect the uh, sample. I would say maybe since twenty ten or something like that, but you uh -huh. know, a, a, a many years, many years. Yeah, but we so, kind of build the bio uh, the, the bio bank. So National Jewish is in Denver, um, and you um, do you you're an, an MD as well. So you're not just researching; you're also treating patients. Yes, so so I'm an MD and and uh, SCD. So I am a physician scientist. So I see patient. How how do you split your time? Uh, so, sorry. Say yeah, again? I'm sorry. We had a little bit of break up there. How do you split your time between time in the lab and time? When you're patient facing, right? So this is kind of, uh, kind of a little kind of difficult to find a balance. But I think it's very, uh, I think seeing a patient with this experience is very important because I really want my research to be uh, applied to the clinical practice. So usually what I do is most I see patient on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, and Monday and Thursday I try to just focus on research. Gotcha. Gotcha. So now, with respect to research, you are launching another uh, project. Tell us, tell us about that. Uh, you talk about the new project. Yes. Yeah. So the, the new project kind of expanding um, what I found initially in the metabolomic, but uh, this new project I'm kind of more focused on the treatment effect. Because we know certain kind of patient when we see and then we usually the, the most common medication we use in the sarcoidosis, other than the other than the steroid will be the mesotrexate. Uh huh. But we know certain kind of patient we start the mesotrexate and then uh they continue getting worse. Maybe one thing, or they just cannot tolerate the mesotrexate. But usually, uh, unfortunately, usually the thing is this may 
may take a, about like six months or three to six months in order for us to kind of figure out the treatment effect or not. And then we know Sacerdotes is so heterogeneous. We, I, I don't think there's a, there's a one medication fit, fit every people. So I would say every people is unique, but how are we able to identify those people that may benefit from mesotrexate or those people that may not benefit from mesotrexate. This is the goal of the study. So I try to uh, do some uh, do uh, a, a blood draw to check for the metabolite even right before they start in the medication. And then uh, in the future, I hope with this kind of baseline blood, we're able to kind of predict the patient is going to respond to mesotrexate or not. We don't need to wait another six months to see in as the first line when they first come, we know they are going to not respond or respond. And then we can kind of think about what's the best alternative medication for those kind of patients if they if we think they are not going to benefit from methotrexate in the future. Got it. Now, so you're you are researching methotrexate specifically. That's not just an example. Like I I don't take methotrexate because my body just I just felt meh. I just had to stop taking it. And I've interviewed a number of people, same, right. same thing. So I'm taking as a theoprene and Humira, but you're right. not testing. You're not testing for those drugs. You're just testing for methotrexate. No, actually the goal is to testing for all, but since this is just kind of pilot grain, just kind of starting. So I decided to do the methotrexate first because they are most people on the methotrexate. We can collect the, the sample size quick. And then, uh, no, I in the in the in the meantime, we continue, you know, getting or actually, I kind of collect the old comer, know whether medication they are. But we know usually, uh, maybe different uh, places have different kind of practice. But usually, people give mesotrexate as the first line therapy, and then the mesotrexate not working or something, then go to the asaprine or mycophenolate or other kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I would start with mesotrexate and the way I got more funding, uh, more money to support me to collect more sample, then I will expand. Then you'll expand that. Yeah. Because the way the way it goes, uh, according to my own personal experience and the patients I've talked to is you go in and, and after a lengthy period, they finally say, oh, you have sarcoidosis because it takes a while it, it, to find sarcoidosis. Most doctors are not looking for that. They're looking for something else because it's, you know, sort of an out there disease. Um, so they finally say, all right, sarcoidosis. Then they say prednisone right away. Let's get you on prednisone, get it under control. Then we're going to put you on methotrexate um, to see if we can't then keep it under control. Uh, if methotrexate doesn't work, then they'll try as a theoprene or a number of other drugs and just keep on going Remicade and, and the drugs that, that we, we hear over and over. But it can take a couple of three years of failure before you finally get the right drug for the right person. And that's that you're trying to shorten that time, right? Right. So this is, I think this is a, the important thing. Like, you know, usually we do a mesotrexate after three to six months they're not working or patient cannot tolerate, then we switch to ASAPRI, right? So, but we already lose maybe three to six months. So my goal is, let's say we draw the blood baseline before we even we start on the medication. I say, okay, I don't think you, I, I think that's highly possible. You're not able to tolerate mesotrexate or mesotrexate is not going to be effective based on your um, blood work then why don't we just give a cyprin in the, in, the, in the first place rather than wait three months failure uh, of the mesotrexate. So this is kind of the main goal of my, uh, this uh, um, uh, upcoming research. Okay, so how long before you think you might know some of these things? Yeah, so, so, uh, so um, this current project take a year uh, because the thing is, I need to collect the sample when patient first come here and then six months after. So that would take a take a, a, a while. So I would say maybe for the first part, I probably can have some preliminary, you know, next one year. But I would say, you know, in order to kind of really, uh, really be used, you know, you, you probably want to have a list, like more than 80%, 80 probability of uh, right in order to really, or 70 or 80 at least, I would say, in order to kind of change this kind of practice. So I would say after less, this pilot grant, I need a, a more kind of 
a bigger population to kind of validate the result. So it's yeah. hard to know. It also kind of depends on the grant funding, like or all that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 That's, you got to have money to, to, to keep this thing going. You got to keep the lights on in the lab and you got to eat and uh, have a life and that sort of thing. So I, I understand. Um, so I'm, I, I'm just, I'm curious, first of all, if somebody wants to participate in your upcoming study, how do they do that? And do they have to be in Denver? Yeah, so 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 right now this is the the pilot grant. So they usually uh, will be in the Denver. So usually they come to National Jewish, and then uh and then uh no usually usually my, my plan is usually they come to National Jewish either your second opinion, or they just diagnose at, at a local. They want to come here for our sarcoidosis clinic. Then uh usually we, we, we when they come here we'll collect the baseline blood. And okay. if we decide to be on the treatment, we'll collect on the uh, on the six months. Okay, got you. So, um, so you guys do have a, a big clinic there, and you see a lot of sarcoidosis patients, right? Right. And then another thing is that usually I try to kind of minimize the patient's blood draw. Since blood draw is you know simple, but you still have a poke. So usually I try to when they do the blood, we try to they need to do some other clinical blood. Then we just do collect the atra 10cc plus something like that okay so uh, if somebody is listening right now you you and they're in uh within driving distance or flying distance or what you know whatever it is um it, but they go to national jewish health hospital um you would like to make sure that they enroll in this program if they have sarcoidosis right because we we got we got uh we got uh four sarcoidosis specialists and then we are expanding and then, uh -huh. yeah, but our sacerdotes can they can multiple sacerdotes doctor, and then we all kind of working together, you know, to collect a sample and then try to try to see if we can kind of advance the sacerdotes research. So yeah. if they come to see any of us, then we we appreciate um, the, the patient able to uh, help to contribute the blood for us for our research. Right, right. So, so in your opinion. I mean, what do you think causes sarcoidosis? I mean, you're down there looking at it at the molecular level, and I've heard everything from something I breathed in to something I ate to bad luck. I mean, what <laughs> What do you think it is? Right. So, so I'm like, I would say maybe I'm a little biased because I just do a lot of genetic study, and then we definitely found uh, we did definitely find certain kind of genetic uh, locus or genetic risk variant. They can uh they they are so strongly associated with sarcoidosis. So I do think sacro, uh, genetic play an important role. Uh, we also have other uh, other kind of study and identify or not not just us also other uh, other group identify certain kind of occupational exposure. They may be a, a, or like certain kind of uh, certain kind of job title. They may be associated with the the sarcoidosis. Although it's, right now it's difficult to kind of identify specific occupational exposure that can cause a sarcoidosis. So I would say a mix of genetics and environmental uh, exposure. Yeah, so you're just the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, I think it can be. Or if you got some genetic stuff, like usually in the HOA area, if you've got a genetic uh, risk factor there, and then you happen to expose to certain kind of environment exposure that may give you a little higher risk of a sarcoidosis. So there's there's some at least anecdotal, maybe more than anecdotal evidence that people who are exposed to all of the dust and everything that happened after the buildings collapsed um, in New York City on 9-11 um, have a much higher incidence of sarcoidosis. What might be the connection there? Just using that as an example, right? So, so I, I think dust, uh, based on the the World Trade Center uh, experience, we do see the dust. They, uh, the, the like like you said, the incidence can increase. So that may be one thing. But the thing is, it's very difficult to identify, you no know, specific what kind of dust exposure. They are, you know, in our in in other people's research, we, they also identify the firefighter they may have a higher risk of getting sarcoidosis. So this is sometimes, but it's very difficult to kind of 
kind of uh, split out or kind of to say which kind of dust or which kind of specific thing that can give you sarcoidosis. Yeah. So I look at the, the populations that tend to get sarcoidosis. Uh, African-Americans are the predominant group, but then you also have Northern Europeans. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm painting with a very broad brush here. So forgive me if I'm, if I'm oversimplifying, but just for the Kate, you know, just to make a, an interesting conversation here, uh, those two groups would seem to be about as far apart as you could possibly have. Right. The, the, the white people from the North of Europe and then African-American people with dark skin uh, who uh, evolved in a different part of the world. Why would those two be the groups? Is there any commonality there? Right, so I, I think that the interesting thing is um, actually not like in Denver, in Denver, in our nation of Jewish, maybe because of location, you know, we basically, we, I would say, I cannot give you a, 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 a number. I would say maybe 80% of them are Caucasian white. 80%? Yeah, in our, uh, in our sacerdosis uh, 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 population. Or, you know, basically in our like GWAS research, we collect around like 1,300 uh, people. They are all European descent, uh, Caucasian huh. white. Okay. So, so there's a huge population, uh, you know, not just the African American, even the Caucasian white. Uh, they are not necessarily from the, the, the Northern Europe. They have a sarcoidosis. Okay. And, and interestingly, or you can say, no, we, this is not in, in here. Another big group, like a sarcoidosis, Japanese. So Japanese have a lot of sarcoidosis. The thing is, the, the phenotype, like we say, the sarcoidosis is so heterogeneous. So every people, when they present with sarcoidosis, can be different. So what we see is, let's say for the uh, Japanese, they got sarcoidosis, they got a lot of sarcoidosis in the heart. They got a lot of cardiac sarcoidosis. Are you saying ja Japanese? Japanese, yeah. Japanese, okay, yeah. Okay. Right. So they got the, the sarcoidosis in the heart. And then uh, for the European people or like North Europe and uh, Northern Europe, they have this we call like low brain syndrome. They have this a lot presentation of acute sarcoidosis. Everywhere. Yeah, uh, acute like like a uh, low brain. So usually they, they come with the fever, they come with skin rash, they come with joint pain, and then comes and then goes away real quick. We call right. it low brain syndrome. So this kind of specific. Uh, in African American, the presentation is also different from the Caucasian, ca Caucasian um, white. Uh, and then, so they just have a different kind of, they all call sarcoidosis, but I would say there's a different kind of phenotype connect to different kind of isonicity. Okay. And yet the same treatments work for all of those people, no matter where it is in their system. So, so this is the is kind of one of the the, the the reason I want to kind of study on treatment because currently the, the standard of care basically we do like one size fit all right. So every people you know you are African American you you have pulmonary sarcoidosis. Another people may have cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, another people may have sarcoidosis in the eye. Then we all use the mesotrexate as our first line usually. Uh, so this is the kind of thing. And then some people respond well, some people not. So right now the treatment will be similar. You know, they have some different kind of multiplication that like you've got neurosarcoidosis, maybe a bit different, but I would say overall they are similar. Steroid, mesotrexate, um, and mycophenolate, and then not working, anti-TNF-alpha, like Remicade. Uh, then Remicade? Right. At the very end? Yeah, usually some people will say like neurosarcoidosis, they probably will introduce Remicade a little earlier compared to all of them. Neurosarcoidosis. Right. Right. Which is that's that's that was the path that I took. So yeah, I, I know that path. Right, right. I right. know that path. Um, but uh fortunately for right now, everything's under control. So let's hope it stays that way. So uh how do you how do you follow this through the body without being too technical and, and speaking over the heads of those of us who don't have MDs and, and <laughs> specialties in, in microbiology? How do you follow sarcoidosis 
through the body, through the bloodstream, and identify these markers. Right. So, so, so usually what we what we think is, you know, not just sucker, just kind of over disease is DNA is our genetics, and they can affect the RNA, and they can affect the gene expression. So we think this gene expression, they can change, they can they can affect not just by the genetics part, but they can also affect by the environmental factors. And also the medication you are getting, they can actually change the gene expression or change the metabolism. So what we see is we try to catch uh, those gene expression change or those metabolite change, they are affected, uh, they are affected by the different kind of sacrodosis. So we okay. think the body is kind of complicated, but what we think is this gene expression metabolite or protein, they change you how your body responds to all that all kind of stuff. Gotcha. So when you have all of these patients who come to see you in the days that you're um, not doing the research and you're going through your natural progression of the drugs and so forth, is there a percentage of patients for which nothing works? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. Uh, we do. We do see. Uh, I would say that luckily, most of the patients they are eventually work. You know, usually I have a certain kind of patient that difficult to treat. We start with prednisone, mesotrexate, patient cannot tolerate mesotrexate. We switch to azathioprine, cannot tolerate azathioprine. We switch to Celsep, and then uh, and then still not working, then we go to the Remicade. Right. Uh, most, I would say majority of patients when we do those kind of routes, not able to be in the control in, in, in two years, three years. But the thing is, it takes around like two to three years to kind of figure out the right regimen. Yeah. I have um, a minimal, certain small amount of patient, uh, just not really working well. We can just kind of barely control and not able to kind of fully recover. But I would say most of the patient, majority of the patient, when we do the Remicade, you share the response okay. Yeah, I had a doctor tell me that Remicade has to work. He, he looked at me and said, Remicade has to work. And I said, well, that's not consistent with what I'm hearing from patients. You know, yeah, I, he didn't really know that I was doing all this, or maybe it was before. But the point is, is this doctor just looked me in the eye and said, Remicade has to work. I mean, there's just no way it can't work. And I don't know enough to, to, to uh, argue with my doctor, but it just doesn't seem consistent with what I was hearing. Is that, how, do you, how would you square all that? I, I would say I would say it also depends on the uh, uh, in which place you see uh, the sacerdotal patient. I would say uh, before I joined National Jewish, I was in the UC Davis, so we we, we see a lot uh, a lot of condition, but we also see sacerdotal, but we are not see as many sacerdotal as when I am National Jewish now. I would say most of the patient I, I rarely give need to give the remicade to those patient. So even we see the we see the like I see the patient the National Jewish I would see we see most of the severe patient severe cases. So you no know, referred by the local community or other kind of institution. Usually they refer to us if the patient is not respond to the steroid or mesotrexate and then they send to us and then we we initiate a remicade. So I would say all oh, kind of depends on the, the how many patients you see. And how severe the patient you saw? I would say, uh, I, I I can say before I joined National Jewish, I, I never see any patient on Remicade. So I would might I might have a kind of similar conclu conclusion and say a oh, Remicade must work because I don't have patient need to be on Remicade. But when I joined the the National Jewish, I just see so many kind of severe sick patient. We do see certain patient they just with a Remicade. I would, not say, I would not say Remicade not working at all, but I would say those some patients, the Remicade may just able to count, barely control their disease. Yeah, yeah. Now I want to ask you about Cytoxin because I went through a pretty painful year taking Cytoxin. Now, you haven't mentioned that as one of your therapies that you recommend because um, it's a chemo drug. Is that something that's out there that not many doctors use or what do you think of Cytoxin? Right, so uh, so you talk about uh, you talk about sacrophosphomate, right? Satasin. 
That's the, yeah, the long, yeah. So toxin is the easy way to say it. Right, right, right. So um, I, I mean, um, I would say, I would say maybe depends on kind of different, I would say most people or you see the, the guideline, you know, the consensus, the the ERJ, uh, in which there's such a recent uh, a recent guideline about treatment in the ERJ. Uh, that one is not uh kind of use commonly used. So I usually use the 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 mycophenolate uh uh mycophenolate uh cell or cell sap as mesotrexate. And what we see is usually if those three medication not working we don't think this worth trying another kind of oral agent. Usually we just go go for the uh, go for the uh, the next label. Gotcha. Gotcha. So so you you don't you don't you don't think cytoxin is that effective or that common? I cannot you know I cannot I, I would say probably not that common. I cannot really comment on does the cytoxin working or not because personally I didn't use that. And then uh we, in, in, in my colleague, in national jurist, in the, with my colleague, we rarely use that. So I cannot really comment use or not. I can only say it's not a common medication uh, I use in a, in a uh, sacerdosis for the right. sacerdosis patient. Right. Do you, I don't want to be morbid, but yeah. are there some patients who just die from sarcoidosis? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yes. So, uh, the, the the thing is the thing is most patients, uh, I would say probably less than the no this data maybe continue to change, but probably less than five percent of people really die from sarcoidosis itself. Most people still dying from kind of other disease, you know, current artery disease, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, I do have some patient unfortunately got a sarcoidosis and then uh, die from the the the, the COVID infection. Oh, so, from COVID, yeah. yeah from the COVID. Yeah. So, so we we do see, you know, sarcoidosis, especially base sarcoidosis, definitely put you on high risk for certain kind of infection, all that thing. But it's uh, sometimes very difficult to contribute to sarcoidosis itself. So right. I would say, so these are, um, I would say, fortunately, not many people die from sarcoidosis itself. Right. I, it stands to reason, I guess, that um, if you've got pulmonary sarcoidosis and then you get COVID on top of that, it's going to be much harder for your system to re, to overcome it, right? That's correct. Wow. That Do you see many of those cases or have you through the pandemic? Yeah. So I probably see one or two. Uh, the, I think that the good thing is our patient, uh, our sarcoidosis patient, when they see the, the national Jewish they, they really, uh, you know, they usually get the COVID shot, you know, they're fully vaccinated, uh, you know, with the, the new evidence, they all get booster shot, as most of my patients get, get, a, get a shot. So I think, fortunately, I do have a several uh, second dose patients, especially with this kind of Omicron, probably in the, in the past one, two months. I have a several second dose patients that got COVID, even they got the three dose of a COVID vaccine. But the good thing is they don't even need to go to the hospital. They stay home. They got some fever. They recover because they they are fully vaccinated. So because they got the vaccination, right? So they yeah. the the symptoms they think is kind of less. So I don't see. Fortunately, I don't see too many patients. They are fully vaccinated. Uh, they are sucker dose. They end up need to be in the ICU or no pathway. I mm-hmm. I rarely see a uh, lost kind of patient. Yeah, early on, there was some concern that uh, those of us with sarcoidosis taking these autoimmune drugs, that whole that whole list of drugs that you've mentioned, um, when we got the vaccine, our bodies would not produce antibodies for the illness. But I guess that's not true. It sounds like you're saying, no, the vaccine works even if you're taking all these autoimmune uh, uh, medications. Right. So, so this is kind of interesting. So, so this can be true or cannot be true. The reason is... This is not, I, uh, beyond this kind of sucker, I also do the, the COVID research, the, the vaccination research. So this is kind of the, the separate topic. So we do see uh, in the national Jewish, not necessarily sarcoidosis, but you, if you're taking the, the immunosuppressant, there's a high possibility your body is not able to produce enough antibody to the COVID vaccine. But you yeah. might have, still have some. Right. So you might still have some. So that's I mean, people have been 
been very concerned about that. And some of the, the podcasts that I've done where I talked about COVID and, and antibodies and so forth, or had I didn't talk about it. I had experts on talking about it, but those have been the most listened to podcasts through the pandemic, for sure. So obviously, that's something people want to know. Right. So I would say if you, especially a lot of our suffer those patients taking the uh, immunosuppressant, so I would say, you know, if you are a sarcoidosis patient, you're taking the immunosuppressant, even you are fully vaccinated, you are still need to be very careful about the social distancing and masking. Because vaccine is good, vaccine definitely helps, but it's not like 100% protection. Especially you are taking the immunosuppressant, then you get a little higher risk compared to other people. They are not taking immunosuppressant. Got it. However, um, the immunosuppressant might actually tamp down the severity of COVID it, all by itself, yes? Uh, but um, it is, I, I probably would not say that way. Uh, you can okay. say uh, maybe not, because usually when, if I got a, some patient got sarcoidosis, they take immunosuppressant, they got a COVID infection, I would advise them to stop the immunosuppressant. because really? we. Yeah, because we are we want our body to come kind of fight uh, for for the COVID, right. but but other part I think what you say is also in in in, in right in, per, in in some perspective is when people have severe COVID, we'll use the steroid to kind of calm down with like kind of inflammation because if your inflammation is too too much out of control then we'll use the steroid, but we probably will not, we will not give the, the, the immunosuppressant. Okay. All right. Well, doctor, I appreciate your time this morning. I feel badly um, t- keeping you away from either your patients or your lab research. Uh, if people want to participate in your study, they need to kind of be in uh, the Den- general Denver area. Although I would imagine you have people travel great distance to come to the clinic there. Um, but how would they how would they participate? What would you like them to do? So yeah, so so I, I would say um, I would say for the first, I mean, I, we see a lot of patients out of state come to National Jewish, and then uh, usually myself or my my colleague will kind of ask the patient, you know, are they kind of interested in participating in any kind of research? And if they are, we will have our research coordinator talk to them during the. Uh, not right after a clinical visit. Uh, we, we, not just my research, we, in our group, we got a lot, a lot of ongoing research. And then the patient can kind of free to choose what kind of research they want to participate or they don't want. So, so they don't need to be come here twice or something. Come here, see us, you know, as their clinical regular clinical visit. And then we can have some people kind of to help to facilitate to explain the research and what 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 the impact, well, what we need, all, all that kind of thing, and they can they can decide and go from there. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, I you know, I don't know how you landed on uh, sarcoidosis as the illness you wanted to research, but I, I'm glad you did. And I want on behalf of all the listeners, I want to thank you for working on this orphan disease. Yeah, I think I think this is important uh, for the to people to kind of study the sarcoidosis and also kind of recognize this kind of disease. You know, sarcoidosis is a disease still in the mystery. So this is one of the reasons I try to, you know, I like to solve the puzzle. And then uh, this is a rare disease, a lot of opportunity, people not many not not people, not many people aware of the disease. I try to see with all this research can kind of uh, increase the awareness of this disease. All right. Dr. Liao, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, John. I feel like a zombie Just feeding and stumbling So thanks to Dr. Liao for joining me. He's promised to keep me updated on his research. And wouldn't it be great if he could begin predicting who would need a certain medicine, methotrexate or others right off the bat? 
and you don't have to go through that trial and error period, which means you could be facing three years before they finally find a therapy that works for you. So this is really, really critical research. And on top of that, if he can predict whose SARC will go away and whose will progress through the body and all of a sudden start affecting multiple organs, that clearly would be a step toward finding a cure uh, or finding control. And um, even he felt like, you know, that that would be a step towards really figuring out the cause of sarcoidosis. So let's look forward to the hope that comes from his research. A couple of reminders. First of all, the official Sark Fighter song is called Zombie by Mark Steyer, who plays in a band called the White Hot Lizards in Alberta, Canada. You can hear his story, the story behind those haunting lyrics way back in episode 12. And remember, I call this the Sark Fighter Podcast because I'm fighting Sark and so are you, whether you're a caregiver, a patient, a researcher like Dr. Liao, a doctor. I hear from all sorts of people who have discovered the podcast and they're coming from all angles of this. And I'm always amazed and pleased when they think it's worthwhile to listen. Uh, of course, what I hear the most is from Sark patients who felt like they were all alone. They don't know anybody who has Sark. They don't understand what they're up against and they want a reasonable and rational description and understanding of what's going on. And that's what we try to provide here. And I just want you to walk away after listening and know that there's a reason to hope. And I do release the podcast every other Monday. Please don't forget to go back and listen to the bonus episodes on SARC and COVID and another bonus episode on dealing with prednisone. These are rare opportunities to have the top people in the field talking about COVID, talking about prednisone, listening to patients and understanding that people are out there trying to find solutions to these problems and giving you understandings of what you might be up against, especially you're taking these autoimmune medications and now you're taking the vaccine and is it going to work? Is it not going to work? And I appreciate uh, Dr. Liao touching on that during our, during our interview today as well. Um, if you want to go back, if you're looking for like just the basics about sarcoidosis, because uh, I know we've done some deep dives, especially today, Go back and listen to episode two with Dr. Simon Hart. That's sort of our basic primer. Episode uh, two is, is Sarcoidosis 101, and Dr. Hart kind of goes over what's going on in your body. If you want to hear more on uh, my backstory, that's episode uh, one, and the backstory to the founding for the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is episode 11 with Andrea and Redding Wilson, the two people who founded the foundations who's making all of this happen. Uh, if you're interested, if you have a comment on the podcast, even if it's just to say thank you, uh, it's very gratifying to me, I'll just admit. So send me an email in the show notes, or you can uh, go to the website on Podbean that hosts the Sark Fighter podcast, and you can send me a message there. But I do appreciate it. If you want to appear on the Sark Fighter podcast, the best thing to do is ping me at my email address, uh, and that is um, carlinagency at gmail.com. You can also follow The Sark Fighter on Instagram. I also have a Facebook page under Sark Fighter. And I just appreciate your interest in the Sark Fighter podcast. It helps me reach more people and grow the audience if you'll share it on your social media. So click on that link, copy it, put it out there on your Instagram or your Facebook or your TikTok or wherever it is, or just talk about it, that would be uh, greatly appreciated because the more people we, re we reach, the more people we can help and give hope to. And maybe just give the show a nice review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the Sark Fighter Podcast. So thanks again for listening. I do appreciate it. And until next time, keep fighting. Keep fighting.